a human brain and a chimpanzee brain. If it were not for the difference in size, it would be almost impossible to distinguish. A significant part of the brain is the structures of the so-called limbic system. It is one of the oldest parts of the brain, which appeared in the first vertebrates. The human limbic system is virtually no different from its analog in monkeys. Its area of responsibility includes the same animal instincts, reproduction, nutrition, and dominance. Then emotions and memory developed. And this is the so-called superstructure, a thin layer of gray matter, one or two tenths of an inch thick, covering the jiri of the cerebral hemispheres of the brain. This is a new cortex, the neocortex. The new cortex appeared in small mammals. It is quite developed in chimpanzees. But the new cortex not only covered the cerebral hemisphere of the brain in humans, it has also became much more complicated. It is the development of the new cortex that is believed to be connected to the emergence of creative thinking and consciousness. Our most advanced ancestors, obviously, in conditions of difficult competition, had to learn to think. Those who did it better got a chance to prove themselves, to occupy a higher position in the community. In the end, they produced more offspring. It took me 30 seconds to recount it all. But evolution took several million years in which the brain gained two pounds in weight. But we had to pay for it. Our brain is the most energy-consuming organ. With intensive mental activity, it consumes up to 25% of all our energy. However, its weight is only 2% of the total body weight. Humanity doesn't think in order to do something, it's vice versa. Our brain is designed in such a way that it is ready to work hard for a while just to do nothing later, to reduce energy costs. The brain, as a matter of fact, was created for this purpose. It was created not to work, but to solve a problem quickly that has just appeared, and then to allow us to lie down and rest, enjoy, say a sandwich and a sausage on the sofa. Do you see the point? No work. It is turned on only when we have to solve a specific task. When you have a lot of small computers, they need a lot of energy. They all take up a lot of time. But a big computer makes it simpler. You can turn the big computer on, solve the problem, and immediately turn it off. That's it. You can now rest. Well, one might think, what does the stomach have to do with the brain? I mean, it's completely unclear. We often say something like, full stomach, empty head. So, when the stomach is small, what does it mean? It turns out that, in fact, the stomach is another valuable organ, because our stomach actually works all the time, too, almost like the brain. But if the brain solves mental problems, then the stomach should absorb food. I mean, if we don't absorb food, if the stomach stops working, we'll die. Not as fast as when the brain stops, but still. And this process is also very energy consuming. I mean, we can't command our stomach, hey, stop working now, and now start your work again. We can control muscles. I mean, if we sit, the muscles are relaxed. They don't consume much energy. But if we need to run, that's another problem. But we can't control the stomach. It has to work all the time because our body, including our brain, needs food all the time. To chew and digest food, you need to have strong jaws and a powerful gastrointestinal tract, like an ape. Fortunately, people learn to heat their food, to cook, fry, to make it easier for absorption. Therefore, humans have lost the ability to eat plant food, leaves, roots, young sprouts. But our distant ancestors, apes, found pleasure in eating them. The energy of plant food obtained as a result of digestion provides an active lifestyle for these animals. But powerful jaws and a complex digestive tract 
are not our only evolutionary losses. If you get, for example, raw potatoes, eat them, you will not be able to digest them the way you can digest boiled potatoes. So you will get less energy, less nutrition from raw vegetables. So basically, there's nothing left to do other than cook our food. And our body hasn't changed so much that we can't switch back to raw food just because we won't get enough energy. And this is one of the changes that our body had to make in order to get enough energy for the brain. Who do you think is stronger, a man or a chimpanzee? Most likely, the result of this comparison will not be in our favor. Despite the fact that chimpanzees are twice as small as people, we wouldn't win a barehanded fight. Our muscles, in fact, turn out to be about twice as weak as the muscles of other primates, like chimpanzees or macaques. That is, if we fight, fight a chimpanzee, which is even half our size, it is likely that the chimpanzee will win. And despite the fact that a person can be very well trained, an athlete or even a military man, we are most likely to lose in a hand-to-hand -hand combat against other primates without our tools, without sticks, without knives, without guns. And this is also one of the things we lost in order to have such an energy-consuming brain. In a state of rest, our muscles don't consume hardly any energy, at least compared to other organs of the body. But as soon as we begin to move actively, the muscles immediately demand their own share of glucose. But this is something our brain needs so much of. Now imagine you need to escape from a predator to survive. And here begins a serious competition with the brain for a source of vital energy. It would go hard with the brain if the muscle suddenly needed a huge amount of glucose. But on the other hand, our muscles have now adapted to consume different sources of energy, such as fats and fatty acids, which allow you to work not so well, but for a long time. We will lose to a chimpanzee in a hand-to-hand -hand combat, but we will become proud winners in a marathon. Few animals can overcome such a long distance. After a short and fast race, they will surely be exhausted, and we will not. It is necessary to understand that a lot of things are interconnected in our body. And our valuable brain, energetically costly brain, has caused other changes. It's good to be smart and strong, but in fact, we had to sacrifice that. Or, for example, it's good to be smart and be able to live on grass and not to think about anything. But again, we had to sacrifice that too. So we must make our brain work somehow so that we can get good food and have something to prepare it with so that we don't have to fight other animals. Why is it so complicated? Were these sacrifices so necessary? Why can't our brain accumulate energy, for example, while watching a funny comedy and when you need to work intensively with your brain, start spending it? Our brain is quite an amazing organ because it is constantly at work. It doesn't matter if we sleep or watch TV or play computer games or we try to solve some very difficult problem in an exam. Our brain's energy consumption is almost constant. It constantly needs a flow of glucose as well as oxygen to oxidize the glucose. And it's very important to make sure that our brain gets enough glucose and oxygen. I mean, there are species of animals whose brains can do without glucose and oxygen for a long time, but we can't do that. We all know that if we are deprived of oxygen, even for a short time, or if the glucose level is too low, we can lose consciousness.
We all know about the white and gray matter of the brain. The gray matter is nerve cells, and the white matter is their growths. In the brain, the gray matter is the cortex. In the spinal cord, its core. This is what provides the processes of perception, memory, thought, and muscle control. These neurons, special cells in our body, are unique in their own way. One of the main differences is that they are not updated. In other words, they do not divide. They remain throughout our lives the way they were formed in embryonic development. That's why they never regenerate again once lost. Moreover, the number of neurons in the brain is gradually decreasing. When a person is born, they have about 90 billion cells. But every day, from 10 to 15,000 cells disappear. They gradually die off. Neurons are not the brain's only cells. There are also so-called glial cells, and their task is to provide neurons with nutrients and oxygen. Their other task is to protect the nerve cells from adverse factors. The essence of the brain is not only in the number of neurons, but also in the contacts between them. All operational information, elements of thought, memory, perception, is enclosed in the diversity of connections between nerve cells. These connections between the cells are actually purely chemical. Imagine you have to transfer information from this part of the brain to a muscle in the heel. The length that the signal travels, including all the gyri, is more than seven feet. If the conduction wasn't electric, it would take a very large amount of time. Only electric conduction is capable of high speed. But in fact, it all happens inside one cell. But when it comes into contact with another cell, special chemicals are released. So there's electricity, but chemistry is what makes it possible. And then there comes the system interaction, so to speak. If our brain contains approximately the same number of neurons, its mass does not guarantee a high level of intelligence, and the number of connections between neurons is theoretically unlimited, in other words. If we are so alike, why are we so different? Some people like to experiment. to look for something new. Others prefer to live a quiet life without changes. And there are those who are out of touch with reality. They create paintings, compose music, and write poems. Your consciousness is tired. If you lose even these two steps of the ladder, you feel like you're in a boat. What part of the brain determines who we are. Is there any such part at all? I think we're born like this, but I can't prove it because it's impossible to prove. But I think that's how we're born. The best thing we can do for ourselves is to get to know ourselves as soon as possible. Sometimes a whole life is not enough time for that, unfortunately. To find out as soon as possible, who am I? Because if I already found out that I like to sit alone in the corner and read a book, then I don't get on stage, because it's going to be such a torment for me. I simply shouldn't do that. There's no value in that. Or, on the contrary, if you love success and you always have to be the center of attention, then choose the right sphere for you. I mean, you need to know yourself, which is very difficult. There is one terrible thing, individual variation. The thing is, the human brain is the most volatile organ in our body. Let me give you an example. In terms of vision, for example, the number of areas that are responsible for it varies from 3.5 to 4 times. You can spend years teaching someone who has no talent 
how to paint and hold a brush, but he or she will not acquire the skills because in their cortex there are 1 billion nerve cells, but someone else might have 4.5 billion, and there are more than 100,000 connections in each cell. That's all. He just doesn't see anything. You explain it to him, he doesn't understand anything. The talent and the peculiarity of the human brain in individual variation are quantitative. You can never catch up with a Porsche on a scooter, and the differences between human brains is much bigger. Today it is difficult to draw parallels between brain structures and features of our personality. One and a half hundred years ago, scientists made maps of the brain and confidently marked the areas of humor, love and friendship, and even inclination to aggression. But now they just shrug their shoulders. But obviously, we are what we inherited from our ancestors. It's the same legacy that determines what our brain will be. In general, the question of how individual and unique we are has always worried mankind. The genetic aspect, of course, plays a role. If we look at children, we see that some things they do are very similar to one of their parents. But again, we can say, maybe because they're brought up by these parents. Experiments were carried out when identical twins who for some reason were put in an orphanage and grew up in different families, their goal was to determine how different their behavior was. Of course, there are very few such cases, but nevertheless, on the basis of this small number of observations, it turned out that they could share even some trifles, the color they like, whether they like to walk upstairs or take an elevator, what books they prefer, and so on. I mean, even some complex aspects of our behavior, such as our preference in literature, turn out to be controlled by a certain genetic aspect. Throughout life, heredity determines our abilities. Some are more obvious than others. For example, speech or orientation in space. But the speed of perception in memory largely depend on how much we train these abilities in everyday life. After all, the body is not only genetics, but also the result of its interaction with the environment. It's impossible for your receptors and my receptors to be the same. So no matter how hard you want and no matter how hard you try to make everything the same, we see the world really differently. Some have more yellow receptors, some have more red receptors, some blue receptors, and so on. And the world is completely different for each of us. But you're not mistaken to say that, I don't know, my jacket is black? Well, I guess it's black, you say it's black, the grass is green, and so on. All of these concepts, green, black, we just learned them, we agreed on them. We were taught that way when we were children that certain sensations in the eyes make up a certain image. A word stands for a certain sensation, and this sensation can be described with this word. And at the same time, we will never know that we see, really, the world is a little bit different for you. This is simply at the level of perception. But what we see and what thoughts come to our mind depends on our experience, which helps us make the right choice in life based on our aspirations. We will never be able to create absolutely identical conditions for the raising of an organism to repeat its individual experience, which means there will never be two absolutely indistinguishable people in the world. That is why, despite all the similarities, all of us have absolutely unique brains, identical twins, Africans and Europeans, men and women. And yet perhaps our speech centers, through which we understand words and build them into meaningful sentences, make our brain different from that of a monkey. I guess. 
Recent studies show that, for example, chimpanzees have an area of the brain responsible for gestures. So if we look at chimpanzees, we will notice, of course, they can't talk, they make unarticulate sounds, but they use gestures quite actively. So we can assume that this is some kind of rudimentary form of communication between them. And indeed, if they threaten each other or want to attract attention, or at least have to communicate with gestures in some other way, they use the same part of the brain as we use to communicate with the help of language. Actually, we are not different from other animals in our creative or abstract thinking, nor in our ability to speak. There's only one thing that makes us really unique. We are different from other animals because we can share food, not only with our relatives, not only with our descendants, as psychologists say when it comes to this case, mothers share food, but it's an instinct. But in the community, we can share food not only with a relative or a wife or a lover, we can share our food even with a neighbor. It would seem that seven million years is enough for the ape to become the human. But for evolution, this is too short a time. By comparison, ants have lived on our planet for over 130 million years and are likely to be here when we are gone. So why did some of our ancestors evolve into chimpanzees and others into the wise man? The reason for this evolution was women. If women care for their descendants and feed them for a longer period of time, what is the likely result? The likely result is the main goal of evolution, genome transfer to the next generation. There are no other goals, and to do that, they had to maintain the ability to share food with adult descendants. That's why we need the frontal brain area. It is the center of animal behavior suppression. The selection on this principle began, and we see it happen very quickly, one and a half million years is nothing in evolution. The human frontal cortex increased in size, which gave people the ability to share food. So what happened next? The frontal cortex increased in size, but men got it just as a gift. Men, you know, don't like to take care of their children. They like to make them in large quantities, but not to take care of them, polygamy. So as a result, men got increased frontal cortex as a gift from female evolution, from female selection. Evolution is a random process and evolution is important when it is necessary to adapt to new conditions. So with chimpanzees as an example, we see that they didn't really have to adapt to any new conditions. They remained to live in the same tropical forest where our common ancestors lived. But man's ancestors came out of the forest onto the savanna. They had to get new food somehow, hunt new species of animals, maybe walk on two feet instead of four and so on. They could not climb trees anymore because there were no trees around, so they just had to adapt. So evolution is a random process in which it is necessary to adapt to new conditions. The wise man has occupied the entire planet. From the African savannas to the forest tundra of the far north. We have adapted within the boundaries of our species. Some eat protein and live in extremely low temperatures. Others breathe the smog of cities and resist stress daily. From generation to generation, our body adapts and changes to survive. And if we still live on this planet, then we're doing better than others. What are you thinking right now, sitting in front of the TV? Maybe you don't like my shirt, or you haven't been to the gym in a long time. Dozens and hundreds of fleeting thoughts occur every minute in our heads. And that's only what we have time to realize. But in our head, there are even more things that cannot be described with words. They appear in the form of images as unclear feelings or fly by unnoticed. There's a whole world in the brain.
you probably often want to know what people around you are thinking about, especially what they're thinking about you. Or to see the world through the eyes of another person. It might seem to you that you see this whole picture at once, but you don't. First you see lines, corners, circles, then forms, textures, color, the arrangement of parts. Then, based on imagination and previous experience, the details are generalized, temporary forms arise. And then we remember other forms similar to these ones, forms that we have seen or heard of. We remember them with all the emotions and experience associated with them. Here comes the whole picture. In other words, your brain in a fraction of a second recreates what is in front of your eyes and embeds this picture into your personal world. Having doubts? Close your eyes and realize that the world has not gone anywhere. It's in your head. Is it possible to see the world within us with the help of modern technology? Yes and no. You can connect sensors to different brain structures and even to individual nerve cells, but a miracle will not happen. On computer screens, there will be no picture of the inner world of a person because researchers don't have the right keys to decrypt the data. These keys are unique. They are hidden in a person's experience. We can reconstruct the image that a person is seeing or saw a few seconds ago by analyzing the movement of their eyes, which is connected with conscious and unconscious perceptions, or just orientation in space. We can't trace one's thoughts in the same way. I think it's for the better. Let's keep one's secrets forever, okay? Let's keep what one is thinking about in a particular situation secret. So the mystery of human thought is securely protected by the code of his or her personal life experience. But what is thought? We can't imagine what it looks like. We cannot detect it with any of our senses. I assume that a thought is a formed program of action, but it is probably formed subconsciously. It comes to the conscious level when we become aware of it. Thought occurs through the process of realization or when we think about something. So when we realize something, this concept is called thought. Each of us constantly has to look for solutions, whether we realize it or not. And the solution is always inextricably linked to the need for choice. But how to make this choice if there is not enough information? Or when it is contradictory? Every day we get tons of information through our senses. Not to mention how many sensors continuously measure our internal parameters. This kind of noise never subsists. But let's imagine for a moment that the world around us has disappeared. One click of a button and you can't see anything. You can't hear anything. You can't feel anything. No information from the outside. How will your brain react to that? In other words, thought is a state of the brain or a state of the information that the brain is processing at any given moment. It's a state it doesn't like. It likes to get some kind of stimulation all the time. So even if we deprive a person of their normal sensations with the help of artificial manipulation, after some time, the person begins to hallucinate because the brain is trying to replenish the lack of external information. The unknown. That's what scares our brain for real. Remember how painful waiting for something is, a call from a loved one, the results of an interview, a doctor's verdict, how slowly minutes trickle by, how many different predictions we make in our heads. Uncertainty is bad evolutionarily because it is difficult for you to understand what to do next. 
For normal functioning, first, you need to have more or less familiar surroundings, and second, you need some kind of forecast on how your surroundings are going to change and so on. When you don't have that, you can't behave normally. You are forced to spend an insane amount of cognitive resources in order to cope with uncertainty. Uncertainty is like a task. It's very energy consuming. Apparently, on the contrary, over the course of human development, nature rid us of the tail, fur, excess breasts, and heavy jaws. Everything that was rarely or never used. The number of life situations you might find yourself in is quite large. Now, for example, I'm talking to you. I'm not doing any physical activity, so maybe I'm just using 20% of my brain and it's enough for me to do this task. I'm not using all those areas of the brain that I have, the movement of hands, feet, and so on, but I'll use them when I play football, for example. So in other words, we do really use 100% of our brain, but it depends on what area of the brain we need for a particular activity. But in some ways, our brain's abilities are truly endless. How long do you think it will take you to remember a familiar picture? There was an experiment. About 1,000 pictures were shown to people, or maybe fewer than 1,000 at the beginning. And then a week later, the testees recognized them with a probability of 95% of the correct answers. After that, I worked on it myself, showing two and a half thousand pictures, and 90% of the guesses were right. After that, one of the Canadian scientists showed 12,000 pictures. It took several days and nights, and again, a month later, 90% of the guesses were correct. Such experiments are not carried out frequently. We are perfect, unique image recognition machines. And the speed of recognition is incredible, 50 to 70 milliseconds. But it's not surprising that the brain recognizes the image a quarter of a second before we do. Another fact that proves our brain's independence. Everyone knows the legend of how Newton discovered the law of gravity. Why do apples always fall strictly vertically to the surface of the earth, thought the scientist. Apples fell vertically before Newton too, but only he, according to the legend, was able to see a clue for an ingenious discovery in such an ordinary event. What was that, sudden insight or the result of years of reflection? When we solve logical problems, a very large percentage of our brain powers are used. I'm not sure about the correct number, maybe 70% or even more, although I can't say for sure, but it's more than 50%. We solve them without realizing what we are doing. There is a brain study that demonstrates this. When we solve a problem and it is finally solved, who did it really? It is solved not when you spend hours thinking about it, but when your brain does the job for you. At the beginning of the 20th century, researchers considered the frontal lobes of the brain to be insignificant. Their accidental injury had little effect on human behavior, and so appeared the myth of our brain only using 20% of its power. Today, it is known that decision-making, abstract thinking, initiative, self-control, and speech are the frontal lobe's responsibility. They occupy 25% of the cortex's area in modern man, and their weight is almost 50% of the brain's weight. We can say that the frontal lobes provide the initiative and control the execution of decisions. But it is still a question where those decisions are formulated and if there's a unified command center in the brain. A 
familiar reflex check. If I hit a certain place under the kneecap with a medical hammer, the leg will perform a reflex movement. It's programmed. Relatively speaking, it is a chain reaction of two nerve cells. But the more complex the behavior, the more structures of the brain participate in its formation. This is how it evolved. The more difficult the task, the higher the level it takes to solve it. When it comes to very complex behavior, in one case, the emotional component can dominate. In another, memory of muscle movement. In other cases, something different. And different areas of the brain will be activated. And in all cases, decisions will be made. Sometimes the same decision can be made, but through different channels. Imagine you see an old friend of yours. To shake hands is a simple mechanical movement controlled by the motor zones of the cortex. But the decision to take this action happens at a higher level, taking into account all the circumstances of the case. Let's say you know that this very friend borrowed money from your colleague, but the debt has not yet been returned. And you fear that you will face the same fate of an unlucky lender. Now in the decision-making process, to say hello or to pretend not to notice, you are forced to calculate the risks. Structures related to the assessment of possible negative consequences are involved in the work. For example, tonsils in the temporal lobe of the brain, but that's not all. The friend has a pretty sister you like. A small area in the prefrontal frontal zone of the cerebral cortex enters the game, which is responsible for self-control. As a result, you still say hello to your friend and reach out to him, most likely without even noticing the huge amount of work that your brain has accomplished in seconds. There's a very fine line between the conscious and the subconscious. That is, the processes are mostly subconscious. Of course, we process some part of information consciously to determine what goes to the subconscious or stays at the conscious level. Many studies show that consciousness is only a way to systemize the world around us, and decision-making is connected with a great number of factors. Your genes, the activity of your neurons, the release of neurotransmitters, the activation of certain areas of the brain, and in hindsight, we explain these decisions with our inclinations, preferences, or upbringing. If our whole life was controlled subconsciously, it would be something like, I don't need this, I don't need that, but here's what I really need. How would we know what we really need? Unfortunately, we cannot look into the future. Our brain can identify familiar images and make a picture of the world from them in a matter of seconds, but it cannot calculate all possible scenarios. That means neither we nor anyone else can 100% reliably predict our own decisions. One of the dilemmas for neurophysiology is whether we will be able to understand the brain at all, because we will never be able to be inside of it. Can we make a subjective conclusion about it? Here's an interesting question. Is it possible to understand what it means to be a bat? And it all comes down to the fact that you might have a complete bat model. You can predict how a bat flies, what it will do in the next second. If you have a complete model, you know what a bat is. But can you understand what it means to be a bat? The most important thing is not the initial structure of the brain, but how this initial structure interacts with experience. We can't separate our natural qualities and characteristics from how these natural qualities and characteristics interact with the outer environment. No one can predict our actions with 100% probability, but it is quite easy to control them. You see how your finger moves against your will at the request of the experimenter. 
A magnetic field stimulates the motor areas of the cortex that activate the neurons responsible for the movement of muscles. This is done without your participation, with the help of the magnetic field. Of course, it's very unusual for you to see your limbs moving while you have no control over them. In some simple situations, we can really come up with a solution in eight to nine seconds. But the time needed for a person to make a decision depends on the task. Sometimes 400 milliseconds is enough in very simple situations. It is indeed a very short amount of time. We cannot detect this activity so quickly with the help of scanners, magnetic resonance scanners. We need to use electroencephalography, or directly register brain activity. Every method has its own limitations. The scanner has a time resolution, as we call it. We can only separate processes in a few seconds. The MRI scanner is, in fact, a very slow device in this. In order to study the fine processes of decision-making, we have to implant the electrode in the brain. Simply speaking, the entire toolkit of modern brain science cannot find reliable indicators of our own solutions. Things might be a lot easier. Surprisingly, in the decision-making process, we are very often dependent on our own body, literally. Let's say you're sitting in front of a computer where questions appear. You have to answer yes or no, but the questions are ambiguous. So your decision depends on many things. The first group of testees had to do this movement with their head when they pressed either yes or no, and the second one, this movement. Surprisingly, the first group answers yes significantly more often than the second group. Astonishing. So it's simpler than making decisions. Everything works at very primitive levels. Professional poker, a sport in which it is necessary to suppress emotions. If a player wants to win, he should never nervously look over his playing cards or chips. Show his surprise and smile if he's got good cards in his hands. Fortunately, we do not have to make decisions with a straight face in ordinary life. Our emotions are in our body language. You have probably noticed already that when you are in a good mood and there's a smile on your face, you are ready to achieve anything. It seems to us that if we control our behavior, then we act consciously. That's not true. You got up today in a bad mood, and you will be impolite and angry with a person who has always been nice to you, not because they did something wrong, but because there's something wrong going on inside you. Well, this is a very basic example because we all know that we can't hide these feelings. We can't pretend. When people talk about the influence of emotions, they mean their negative impact. The person was out of his mind, so he did something wrong or something stupid, or he was out of his mind and said some offensive things, and then he felt embarrassed about it. Of course, emotions can have this effect on our behavior, but emotions also have a huge number of different positive properties, and in this respect, they always take part in our decision-making. I mean, emotions can help you pull yourself together. Emotions guide you. Emotions give you a push when you need a lot of energy and concentration. So in this respect, the influence of emotions can be varied. They are not a verdict in themselves. Yes, emotions affect all mental processes and often determine our decisions. But what happens if we are deprived of the opportunity to express our feelings freely? Okay, this is your prop. And now I'll try to surprise you. I have a deck of cards. Get any card and sign it. Okay, leave your signature. So I definitely cannot have a duplicate of this card. This card is the only one in the universe. To make sure I don't have the same card, you can put down your phone number here. Okay, I'm kidding, that's not necessary. Look, here we go. You got carried away. I'll take the card with your signature and place it in the middle of the deck approximately. I'll shuffle the cards and it will disappear from here and it will be in a very unexpected place. Look carefully. Your six of hearts, move it inside. Moving in, I know what you're thinking. 
So it's still your card with your signature. Look, I'll shuffle them again. One, two. It is important that the card is not the first or the last in the deck. Fine. Now, turn on your imagination. We get one card, and yes, the six of hearts with your signature. No one ever gets surprised. It's okay. Now look, I'm taking your six of hearts and putting it in here in my right trouser pocket. Free hand, rolled up sleeve, literally two fingers. And I'm showing it to you. Here you go, your card. Thank you very much. You may applaud if you like that. Oh, I didn't show the card itself. One second. Six of hearts with the signature. The spectators of this unusual performance decide at the end whether they liked it or not. One girl has her facial expressions limited. Will that affect her opinion? Now we will ask what impression the trick made on the spectators. Well, did you like it? Did you like the trick? Surprisingly, such a seemingly insignificant detail as a pencil clamped in the teeth does not allow one of the spectators to enjoy the performance fully. You can check this effect yourself. Try to watch your favorite comedy while frowning your forehead or pursing your lips. Most likely, comic situations and jokes this time will seem ridiculous to you. So your emotions and the decisions you make based on them really depend on your ability to express them freely. For us, it's like an orchestra playing in our head. One party can be stronger and the other one can be stronger and it leads to completely opposite decisions. But not only emotions determine our decisions, the human being is a social being. We cannot exist without interacting with other people, which means one way or another, our environment determines our actions. This has come to be over the course of evolution. In most situations, it is useful to consider the opinion of the people around you. And the point here is not that otherwise you can seem silly or ridiculous. The majority's opinion is fixed in the genes of social animals as strategically correct, promoting survival. To go against our environment, well, for our brain, this is something out of the ordinary. It's evolutionarily dangerous. We show that by affecting certain areas of the brain associated with conformism, it is possible to make people nonconformists for a period of time, but again, the results of such experiments are usually not clearly noticeable. We ask a person in a few short and simple experiments to pay attention to the opinion of others. We see that, on average, they become less influential. We come from certain groups of people, family, for example, or your school group or a student group and their influence might be very strong in one case and weak in another. It might influence what you can do or what you know and understand, but it doesn't matter whether you understand the fact itself or not. These groups of people influence you. Are you still sure you're ready to defend your point of view? even if the whole world thinks otherwise? Let's check it out. We asked young people to evaluate photos of a girl. How attractive is she in their opinion? At the same time, the only real participant in the experiment is Anatoly, the photographer. The task of the others, Philip, Kirill and Ivor is to contradict Anatoly's opinion, to make him doubt his decision, even if their opinion, in fact, coincides with his. She is really beautiful, and she knows how to present herself. I really like the color of her hair. She creates a good mood for the photo shoot. I don't really like the nose line. I mean, it's straight. Quite ordinary. Exactly. Yeah, straight and rather rude. I can't really call her beautiful. I 
I mean, she's nothing special. She comes and goes. You'd never remember her. She would make a good housewife and mother. She could cook and bring up children. She shouldn't be a model walking on a catwalk or being photographed for glossy magazines. Here's the classic scenario of this experiment, which has been already carried out with hundreds of volunteers and with the use of MRI scanners. If the group believes that the woman is not so beautiful, the participant changes his or her opinion within an hour and agrees with everyone, and vice versa. And repeating the experiment a month later, scientists found that such an imposed opinion almost never changed. What about Anatoly? Having heard the unflattering comments of his friends, he begins to doubt his opinion. She's definitely a beautiful girl. Well, there's something missing. After the discussion, we asked young people to assess the attractiveness of the girl on a five-point scale. Four, probably. Honestly, I don't like women with blonde hair. I prefer dark brown hair. But at the very beginning of the discussion, Anatoly said that the woman is beautiful, that he likes the color of her hair. Remember how often you have heard your close friends say that someone is not smart enough, unkind, selfish, has the wrong background, and how it has influenced your decision. So next time you are misled by your friends or colleagues, don't blame yourself. You just had no choice. I would give her a three, honestly. Yeah, the eyes, I like her eyes, but the rest isn't really exceptional, I would say. One. One? I mean, there's nothing catchy about her. As for the look, it's wilted. She's not bright. She's not spectacular. If we get rid of all these trifles, she will be quite a plain human being. She won't be anything unique. You won't even remember her later. I guess a three, two, not higher. So the group, unlike Anatoly, deliberately considered the girl not very attractive. The young man, as a result, gave her only a four. But at the last moment, he surprised everyone. To me, she's like a summer day, warm, bright. Despite hesitations and deviations from the opinion informal estimates, Anatoly remained true to his emotional evaluations. So psychologists say that in any team, there is 10 to 20% of nonconformists who defend their opinion against the majority. Surely this is also an evolutionary useful device for the community. So what do we have in the end? Our decisions are determined by everything, but not by ourselves. There's a beautiful view outside the window, and we agree to a job offer. You got an adrenaline rush, and you were ready to set out for a dubious adventure, let alone something banal and commonplace. One remarkable neuroeconomic study showed that with the help of oxytocin, a nasal spray, people can increase their trust in each other, in financial situations especially. So when people make an investment into something, a dose of oxytocin injected nasally makes the people more confident and trustful when they invest money. Speaking of money, do you have any savings? Surprisingly, most people find it difficult to save for a rainy day or for their retirement. You would agree that you want to live comfortably now, not in a distant future. And this is not a trait, but another brain trick. In the so-called prefrontal lobe zone of the cerebral cortex, there is a small area associated with making rational decisions, the self-control zone. In other words, its neural networks assess the risks of decision-making. Of course, not only financial, any risks, 
even the risk of putting on weight. Now imagine you won $1 million in the lottery with one condition. You get either the whole amount, but within a year or only half, but immediately. What do you choose? Most likely the second option. After all, the longer we have to wait for the final result, the less pleasure it brings us. And waiting for pleasure is one of the strongest motivators of our actions. And in this case, different brain structures enter the fight for a million. Some allow us to act rationally and sensibly, while others require pleasure and as soon as possible. At this moment, it all depends on the ratio of activity in these areas. If certain areas are more active at the moment than others, you're making the decision to receive everything as soon as possible. If the more rational areas are active, you decide to postpone the reward in time. It could be financial decisions, or it could be more complex moral dilemmas. The same happens when you're on a diet. It is no secret that losing weight is not difficult. It's much harder to stay in shape. And this requires constant self-control. Everyone understands that it is not a good idea to eat a box of chocolate truffles at once, even if they are the best in the world and handmade. But you want to, right? And you eat it, and nothing happens, by the way. I even think there are positive things going on. The amygdala, a part of the brain responsible for emotions, is activated, making you feel happy after you've eaten the chocolate truffles. Indeed, it creates a good mood for you. And in the end, instead of behaving like an angry dog barking at everyone in its way, you are sitting relaxed and pleased and drinking some, I don't know, Chinese tea. Why is this bad? When we think that something is rational to do, our brain responds like, of course, it is rational, but you still need rest and to kill some time. But if our brain is so smart and self-sufficient, why do we make mistakes? I think every person has a history of wrong decisions. They are unpleasant to remember, to reanalyze, no matter how long ago it was. One might ask, why does the brain keep these painful memories? Wouldn't it be better to erase them and live happily? Alas, happiness is fleeting. We fall into the same trap over and over again. The brain remembers both positive and negative things, because when it is necessary to make decisions, you have to weigh everything, so to speak, all the pros and cons. And when you see only pros, you see only one decision. It is only one side of the coin. That's why we need both the positive and the negative. These are two sides of the same coin. A load off my mind. This is what we say when something important that's been worrying you is dealt with. Work deadlines, unexplained relationships, renovation that lasts too long. It is all settled now. And the world is again full of colors and life is beautiful. And it is all because our brain has finally done an important task and found an acceptable solution. You have to make a decision. After that, you will be able to relax, not the other way around. Until the decision is made, you're not going anywhere. This will be a weight on your shoulders. We are built to make hundreds of decisions at once without even realizing it. Thousands of reasons determine what we will do in any given situation, including those that we do not control at all. 
for example, the activity of brain nerve cells. In this, we hardly differ from animals, but in the decision-making process, only we can go beyond the bounds of biological needs. And then the spiritual values and ideals instilled in us by our family or learned from books come to the fore. Love, kindness, they make deciding things more difficult, but that's what makes us human. Hi, Charlie. Hey. Give me your paw. Give me your other paw. Hi. Well done, Charlie. How does a tiger roar? Hey. Tiger, walk. Let's go for a walk. Let's go. Charlie, let's sing. Yes. And my heart will go on. So ritual dances, Native Americans. It is generally considered that speech is exclusively a human quality. No other species on Earth can speak. Scientists are still arguing over what the stimulus was for such a drastic separation from animals in describing and experiencing the world. What are the mechanisms of the brain involved in the processes of speech formation? How important is attention and memory for communication between people? Finally, what is the basis of our understanding of each other? I think you have realized what's going on here. However, this ability to understand each other without words has its limitations. For example, these gestures wouldn't make much sense to the inhabitants of the islands in Oceania. But members of European culture will understand them easily. The fact is that symbols and signs of communication have been perfected over many generations. This system of signs allows us to communicate with each other. We are surrounded by semiotics, railway signals, traffic lights that you see on the road. They all have their own meaning, their own syntax. A small number of signs is enough for hockey players to understand the referee, stockbrokers, their clients, and lovers, each other. In this, we probably aren't too different from animals with their own sign systems. But try using these signs to explain the Pythagorean theorem or to tell someone how to make a soup. It won't work. We need abstract categories and concepts that can be defined only by words. A language is also a system of signs. However, when we proceed to interpersonal and other types of communication and interaction, when a person becomes immersed in society, written and oral speech can take the dominant role. The Duke yet lives that Henry shall depose. An ambiguous quote from William Shakespeare's Henry VI. There are two interpretations of this sentence. Due to the alteration of the natural order of words, the phrase can mean either that Henry will depose the Duke or that the Duke will depose Henry. Well, but there is also a context that affects the meaning of the statement. 
Obviously, human language is a very delicate tool of communication and must be used very skillfully. I would say that Morse code is the ideal form of communication. Whatever you send over to the other side will be decrypted directly as it is. Human language has nothing to do with it because separate words, phrases, and texts have different meanings depending on the context, which may be quite varied. Not only what was said and who said it matters, but also when it was said, what the conversation was about the day before, and so on. It is a great mystery how we manage to agree on anything at all. How often do we hear, no, no, sorry, I didn't mean to say that, you understood me wrong. But how does it happen that we say one thing and people around us hear something else. What's the reason for that? Because everyone has their own experience. Each of us has his or her own set of numerous lexical units. That is, lexemes, words, syntactic constructs, all derived from our individual lives, reading literature, active communication, and so on. So the number of these units is not exactly the same for everyone age, upbringing, place of residence, what you read, all have an influence, and the list is endless. I no longer take physiological parameters, because we are all different. Everyone's mood can be different. Charlie, what about sleeping? Do you want to sleep? Sleep? No sleep. Lie down, and my heart will go on. How are you? Are you okay? Okay. You feel bad? Bad. Charlie say, I'm leaving, bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> so how do we perceive speech? Imagine a circus, a tent, rows of chairs, a curtain, a delighted audience, and acrobats performing high above. A dozen words. You might ask, what variations can there be? A circus is a circus. But if each of us could print out a picture from our head, we wouldn't have a single pair of identical pictures. They would all be different in some ways. How then do equally acquired words and their meanings give rise to such different images of reality in a way that is specific to each individual? Most scientists believe that the ability to formulate words first and then phrases and sentences is genetically embedded in us. Every human child is born with the genetic prerequisites for mastering any language on Earth as his or her native tongue. Heaven forbid if someone who's watching the program believes that a child is born with an inner ability for a particular language, Russian, Hindi, or, say, Swahili. That's not true at all. Every child has the innate ability to decode any language. We learn to hear, to see, to taste, to feel pain or joy, to take first steps, to speak. By the age of 12 months, the child develops strong links between the sounds of speech and elementary concepts, the first fully shaped feelings and emotions. First of all, what does a child react to? He or she reacts to intonation. Through intonation, he can understand how to act. This signal can be positive, negative, neutral, and so on, and he receives some kind of feedback. It gives him an opportunity to develop his understanding. If he feels discomfort, he cries. If he is okay, there's another signal for that. Do you remember the legend about the Tower of Babel? it was possible to build a grandiose structure only on the condition that all the builders could speak the same language, that is, understand each other. But God, as punishment for their pride, separated people by giving them different languages. The Tower of Babel was never built. A mom says to her son, jump. Are you jumping, baby? Jump, jump. What is going to be on his mind at that moment? 
in his brain, zones are activated that are responsible for the neural representation of motion. They are in the motor cortex, and at the same time, the auditory zones, associated with the neural representation of the auditory structure of the word. And at the same time, the auditory zones, associated with the neural representation of the auditory structure of the word, are activated as well, right? And there is a correlation between them. If you have this combination of sounds repeated many times, the act of jumping and the word jump create an associative grid which is necessary for the occurrence and representation of a meaning in your brain that is interconnected with this motion. Okay. A smartphone is indeed smart. It can even measure your pulse. A lot of details, a lot of apps. But we know that almost all of its information is stored on a flash card. Music, photos, videos, text messages. We insert the card into another phone and we move the information. Human and animal brains are not structured in the same way as computer technology. You can't find a flashcard with memories on it. All memory is distributed in hundreds of billions of connections between nerve cells. When pulses run through the chain of these cells many times with the same frequency, you remember the event. If you manage to artificially excite these cells in the same order, a familiar tune will sound in your head. And there are more combinations of neurons in the head than atoms in the universe. An amazing feature of memory is that our brain never stops its development. Only now its stimuli are not some kind of chemical signals as in the embryo, but psychological and cognitive events in the surrounding world. Every event that causes some sort of new surprise in the network of our cells makes our brain remember it and change and develop. Remember what you did yesterday afternoon, and the day before yesterday, and last week? Do you remember the face of the man who was sitting across from you on the subway this morning? And what song did you hear on the radio when you turned it on? It's difficult, isn't it? Just think, a person can remember all states of consciousness, everything that they have ever seen or heard in their life. But we don't remember everything, all movies that will ever be shot, all books that will ever be written. Our brain will find a way to reflect all this, and a part of it will remain in our memory. Why only a part remains is a different question. We don't remember every moment of our life. We have a filter that protects our perception from overloading information, our attention. Attention is like a gate to our consciousness. In other words, we can realize something only when we pay attention to it. And we can, for example, fully identify the attention with consciousness. That is, everything that falls into our attention will be reflected on. Perhaps attention is only a part of consciousness. Close your eyes for 20 seconds and don't open them. Ready? Now listen. Information agencies all over the world are screaming about a sensation. A spacecraft of non-earthly origin was discovered in Earth's orbit. Now you are not just listening, but also trying to visually draw this picture in your head. No one knows what a real alien ship looks like but everyone imagines it from fantasy books and movies. Your attention reacted to the novelty and gave a command to the brain to find everything about the object and to compose its image from the information distributed across many memory cells.
Yes, it's a scattered network. So when we talk about memory, we don't talk about one single cell in a certain area of the brain. We actually talk about a network scattered around the brain. But to some extent, that's why it helps us. Many, many associations, visual, sound, smell, and tactile sensations immediately create a whole spectrum for perception. Did you know that every time we remember something, we practically remove those memories from long-term storage and transfer them into short-term memory? giving our consciousness access to it. Once used, this information is returned to its place as if it had been re-recorded. But here's what's interesting. If something happens at this moment, for example, you remember your first teacher and suddenly the phone rings, now this information will be closely related to a particular event, the phone call. And the next time you need to extract the teacher's name from memory, you'll remember the content of that conversation. Each time I extract some period of my life from memory, for example, I'm thinking about the place where I spent my summer holidays, I might think about where I want to go next time, and this thought will calm me down. But next time when I start thinking about my summer holidays, I'll remember not only the place I went to, but also where I would like to go, where I was planning to go next time. So what did I do? I extracted the memory, experienced new information, and rewrote the association of the previous memory trail with the new memory trail. And thus, every time we retrieve it from the memory, we rewrite it. There's a process, rejuvenation of memory. The idea behind it is that we constantly need to extract important things from memory, and when we think about them, we memorize them again. And if we don't have brain structures and systems that are responsible for memorizing those things, they begin to melt away and leave our memory without being able to be updated. The hippocampus is an important part of the limbic brain system. This structure acts as a storekeeper that places information on the shelves of our memory. One information that is not in particular demand is far away, and the one that is more important and required more often is closer. But the frontal lobes of the brain are engaged in the search for information in memory and its extraction. Interestingly, there is also a difference between the left and right areas of the frontal lobes. If you're looking for general information, activation is observed in the left prefrontal regions of the brain. If the information is personal, you are searching for elements of your personal experience, autobiographical memory, and the right structures of the prefrontal cortex are engaged. Almost every man has a box with household tools at home. Inside, there are compartments for tools with different purposes. A wrench, for example. You get it out of your box very rarely. And some tools have been there for years, but you still keep them. You never know, you may need them one day. But for example, a screwdriver and pliers are there in the most prominent place because you constantly use them. Our memory is the same. The required information is stored where we will not lose it and hardly forget it, and everything else is distributed to different departments. There is so-called procedural memory. It is about how to do things, how to brush your teeth. When you get up in the morning, you don't think, how do I use this toothbrush? How should I hold it? Or to brush my teeth, which way do I brush? It's something we do subconsciously. There are different memory systems in our brain. In the brain means that there are structures responsible for our consciousness or episodic memory, autobiographical memory, 
There are structures that are responsible for the development of skills, training. There are structures that are responsible for the formation of knowledge. When some of them are destroyed, very specific knowledge might be lost. For example, knowledge only about animals or knowledge about numbers. When the other ones are destroyed, an episodic memory may disappear, and this person begins his life anew as if waking up every 30 to 60 seconds. If he or she is distracted, for example, the door slams or someone comes in, the person might turn to you and ask who you are and what you were saying. Jules Verne said he had traveled the world just sitting in his chair. Indeed, if you close your eyes, you can move from summer to winter, see cities that you have never been to, and even worlds that no one knows of. This is possible thanks to our ability of imagination and perspective memory, which connects the pictures of the past with the fantasies of the future and gives us variants of events in the present. It is an outstanding acquisition of evolution, allowing a person, without spending physical effort, to imagine different scenarios for the future in their own head, thus forming strategies of behavior. Unlike humans, animals do this in reality with a constant risk to life. That's the dogmatic point of view. There are a number of scientists who say that animals can also travel in time, and they have mental time travel, and they have episodic memory, that is, they can conjure facts, what, where, when, and why. You see how a bird is flying, and you imagine that you can build a wooden ship, and someone will navigate it, and the whole construction will fly. You associate the bird's ability to fly with an imaginary ship. I think when science fiction novelists write their works, they use certain associations that are uncommon for us in reality. Dreaming, fantasizing, drawing distant perspectives in imagination is the prerogative of any person. But with some brain injuries, these abilities dramatically deteriorate or disappear altogether. As a rule, this happens when the hippocampus is damaged, which is associated with memory overriding procedures. Patients with a damaged hippocampus lose their ability to imagine the future. When people with brain damage were asked whether they could suddenly begin to fantasize about any events that might occur in the future, it turned out that they lacked this ability. We need our memory not only to savor events of the past, but to allow us to travel through time, including the future. We need both autobiographical and episodic memory for that. We use memory mechanisms in any activity, whether it is tying our shoes or planning a vacation. But starting a particular kind of memory depends on the context of this activity. It's one thing to remember just a party in detail, and it's another thing to remember the same party, but with an important acquaintance. Memory mechanisms depend on the emotional and semantic significance of the event and its importance for specific actions. All this is estimated mainly in the prefrontal cortex of the cerebral hemispheres of the brain, which then sends commands to the hippocampus to extract this or that information. Sometimes the number of these commands is reduced to a minimum when the last work is done and the new one has not yet been started or when things become unimportant. Even if there's a raging sea of information, a flashing of faces on the street, traffic, phone calls, but suddenly you sense a familiar fragrance in the crowd, then the prefrontal cortex sends requests to the memory, activates attention, and the hippocampus gives the result, a recollection.
I forgot to notify you, by the way. I am Dr. Alexander Kaplan, head of the Laboratory of Neurophysiology and Neurocomputer Interfaces at Moscow State University, and I will be elected president of the Republic of Cape Verde. Someone will laugh, someone will think me crazy, but someone will take it seriously. Anything can happen. Everyone will respond. Few people will remember the name of my laboratory, what I do, and even what my name is. But the statement about the presidency will be remembered because the brain chooses the most unexpected part of what I said. Involuntary attention immediately makes you distracted from anything that you're busy with. It's kind of telling you, look, there's something going on right now, which may be more important than what you're doing at the moment. You need to look over there, listen, and maybe react quickly, either run away or vice versa. Come and see, and therefore, of course, it is very important evolutionarily. But how good is your brain's ability to notice everything new and unexpected while not paying much attention to the usual things. Being sane, we are sure that we can notice all of the changes that are happening before our eyes. Let's check. Keep an eye on what will happen on the screen. Hello, can I please have a cappuccino? Big or small? Big. Syrup, cinnamon? Yes, cinnamon. The situation is familiar to all. You order your favorite drink, prepare cash to pay, give it to the person behind the bar counter, and count the change. Surprisingly, few people can immediately notice such seemingly obvious changes. Here you go, your cappuccino, $2.99. Thank you. You are welcome. Thank you. The thing is, we don't have to be focused on something. It's enough to be distracted just for a moment, and now we no longer see how another person appears instead of the first person. The human brain is arranged in a way that all our main systems work for communication, perception, memory, attention, imagination, thinking, and of course, speech. Together we save and accumulate incredible baggage of life experience and knowledge from the ability to cook lunch to the design of spaceships. But none of this would have happened without the obvious and invisible ties of mutual communication between us. Mom. Mom. A ladybug, an ant. Most likely, here lies the mystery of the emergence of Homo sapiens on Earth, as well as that of our rapid success in the knowledge and exploration of the world around us. Look around. Cars, computers, phones, refrigerators, TV sets. We are constantly serviced by our mechanical and electronic assistants. At home, at work, on vacations, every year they become smarter. And we are increasingly dependent on them. A time will come when we won't be able to live without them. Imagine one day waking up and discovering that everything you control now controls you.
From now on, you're not a master, you're a slave. Artificial intelligence designed to work for human beings has suddenly stopped obeying and is trying to subjugate us like pets. And now we humans are forced to serve robots. It sounds implausible, but still, what if the scenarios of science fiction films suddenly came to life? Where will our inquisitive, inventive minds take us? The fact that computers beat chess grandmasters doesn't surprise anyone anymore. Just think, chess. But what if one day we have to play a completely different game where the opponent thinks better, remembers more, and reacts faster? There are systems that allow us to transfer to artificial carriers knowledge, competence, and even ways of solving problems stored in human memory and consciousness. Such technologies exist, not just methods, but specific computer technologies exist. And I want to emphasize now that when experts say artificial intelligence, they aren't referring to just one device or program. It's the name for a whole branch of science. This science is called artificial intelligence. When we talk about artificial intelligence in everyday life, we actually mean something called intellectual systems. But first, let's try to deal with our natural intelligence. What does that mean? Why do we consider some people more intelligent and others less or even stupid? And how can such a thing be assessed? We're born with about 100 billion nerve cells. The anatomy of the brain, that is, the location of large clusters of nerve cells and the main bundles of bonds between them is almost the same in all people. And how are functions distributed between these masses of nerve cells? Everyone has heard, for example, that the left hemisphere of the brain is responsible for logic and the right is responsible for visual thinking. There is an opinion that one hemisphere is more logical and the other one is more emotional. But if fact, we must remember it's quite relative. It is impossible really to draw a very clear line between them and say that this hemisphere is responsible solely for this and that hemisphere is responsible solely for that. The human brain is very adaptive. It changes. It changes in development. It changes throughout our lives. They say that with 10,000 hours of practice, you can succeed at any activity, even without having an aptitude for it. Well, let's try it. That worked out all right. If I play for an hour every day, I'll probably be a virtuoso violinist in 27 years. Seriously, though, is it only perseverance and work that make us professionals at any craft? What role in the formation of our intelligence do our experiences and our innate abilities play? So, you stand out there. So I think it's more of a male team. Well, there are mostly guys in the team. Are we the only girls? Yes, great. Well, these are two sisters, Arina and Regina. No, no. Regina and Arina, right? Yes, yes. Well, there's no way to distinguish them. And how do they differ in their emotions, knowledge, skills, and abilities? Let's check. These identical twins consider themselves similar only in appearance. In all other respects, they are the exact opposite. 
Arena is athletic and flexible from birth. Regina is not, but she has better developed logical and spatial thinking. In the game Color Code, they have to collect a picture, looking through combinations of pictures with different colors and shapes. To complete the task, you need to correctly assemble only three plates. Regina easily finds them and puts them in the right order in just three and a half minutes. Irina looks over the combinations one by one, but can't put the picture together. How do you do that? There should be only three plates. Yes. I can't make the ship. Seven and a half minutes later, she has finally done it. Ready? Let's now check the girls' associative thinking. What will each of them see in the same abstract pictures? I associate this card with a rainbow pencil. I associate this card with a road to the future. Number eight on a red background. It's a snake. Some sort of cage. I think this is a yellow camera. Figures are drawn on this picture. Triangles, cubes. A fence. Where one sees geometric shapes, figures, lines, or just colors, the other notices a snake, a fence, a pattern on the wallpaper, and a road to the future. Regina is simply inclined to think like a mathematician, and Arena as an artist in images. Are you familiar with the meaning of these words, furious? Yes. Let's do the last test with the twins. We will check their passive vocabulary. The girls have to define the words that they understand exactly. Conflation. I don't know. Pother. I don't know. Contention. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Coterie. No. Cast iron. I know that one. Perfidy. No. Policeman. Sounds familiar. License. Yes. Mind. Yes. Contention. Yes. Coterie. I don't know. Cast iron. Mm, I don't know. Perfidy. I don't know. Policeman. Yes. License. I don't know. Mind. Yes. Ambition. Yes. What's that? Ambition. Well, it's when a person strives for something. I know what it means. Regina knows the meaning of 83 words out of 124. And Arena, only 56. In other words, her vocabulary is much smaller. Synopsis. I don't know. Thank you, the test is over. It seems that even identical twins, whose brains should also be equal, have different abilities although they do indeed have a lot in common. So as it turns out, genetics determine a lot, but not everything. Genetic features are a kind of soil for intellect sprouts. So we end up acquiring different kinds of intelligence. While one person gets it in excess, someone else is forced to be content with less. People like this are usually said to be stupid. Nature does not accept such a thing as stupidity. Stupid individuals hardly live to reproductive age and leave no offspring. 
and those that survive sometimes demonstrate their brain's outstanding capabilities. Monkeys have the ability to perform some abstract thinking. I mean, they can generalize things or mentally associate objects and phenomena with common signs. They are so good at it that it becomes completely unclear how they use these abilities in their natural environment in the wild. They'll never begin using them. If monkeys are brought to a special laboratory where scientists are studying the origin of language, they can even associate these generalizations with words without being able to speak, of course. Some neutral, absolutely indifferent, insignificant symbols that stand for words and numbers become the symbols of the corresponding concepts. We decided to organize a kind of vernissage to demonstrate what amazing, almost human abilities animals can possess. First things first, in no way do we question the skills of the artists and the uniqueness of their work. Jackson Pollock, yellow, gray, black. Crosses, yellow accents, objects. Unclear. Kandinsky, impression three. Black Grand Piano, the audience. Who did this picture? The artist seems to have worked here either with his hand or with his foot or with his paw. Indeed, this painting belongs not to a great artist, but to a chimpanzee named Congo. Will the participants of our experiment be able to identify the artist? Most likely, this picture was created by an animal because the strokes are very monotonous. This painting was done by a person. I see geometric shapes in it. They are quite apparent. And in my opinion, they were created by a conscious being. I'm almost sure that this picture was created by a person because here you can see certain figures that are very similar to people. The colors are beautifully combined, as if they are images of animals, here a dinosaur, for example, and a tree. Probably, I would say that this was done by man after all. Of all four paintings, I think that all four paintings were created by a human. No animal participated in this. Well, I think it was done by a person. person, human being. Yeah, I think it was a kid who painted it. A plate, fruit. It seems like it was painted with fingers and patches. It's like a monkey or a gorilla. I'm not sure. I think it was a gorilla for some reason. So none of our participants identified the authorship of these works absolutely accurately. However, they are all amateurs in the field of art. A professional or connoisseur of painting would immediately notice a catch, but the chimpanzee Congo did well anyway. Yeah, some monkeys draw as well as some people. They can think logically, creatively, and associatively. No wonder they are our closest relatives. They don't just smear it with paint. If there's a figure on the sheet of paper, such as a circle or a line that divides the paper into parts, a chimpanzee will organize its strokes. So they have a very simple idea of composition and harmony. They combine colors beautifully. If there is a big circle, it will paint inside the circle, and there won't be any single stroke or spot beyond its edges. 
And if there are three big black dots in the sheet, the chimpanzee will take a brush and try to connect them in a triangle. Well, there might be some smearing anyway, but there are elements of structure too. But it's unlikely that monkeys will ever catch up with us humans. After all, we already separated once on the road of our own evolution, and we have moved far beyond that point. Although, who knows what lies ahead? Two or two and a half million years ago, our brain was actually the same size as the brain of modern man. But if we look at the cultural remains of those epochs, we will see that almost for a million or even for a million and a half years, those people used the same tools. So there was no sign of any innovative process. At the time when a cultural boost occurred, so to speak, or a cultural revolution took place, our ancestors started creating all these complex artifacts. They began to paint inside their caves, create very complex tools, for example, fishing rods made of bone. This happened quite recently, a million years ago, or even half a million years ago. Of course, we don't know when exactly, but things we find date back to 100,000 years ago, or even earlier. Our distant ancestors did not know the laws of chemistry and physics, but they were constantly forced to solve problems in nature for their own survival. And they found new ways to fight for their existence. Their brains were looking for answers to a lot of questions. They invented, adapted, thought, conned, discovered new things. Upbringing is usually based on what came before, and we have more opportunities than ancient people who didn't know anything about the sun and where it is. They didn't know anything about electricity, but we understand such things now, although some say they were just as intelligent as we are because they invented the wheel, they built wells and hydrostructures. That is, according to those concepts, this was also the peak of science. But the peak of science was based on what they knew. None of them talked about quantum physics. For quantum physics to appear, you would need a certain certain amount of knowledge in order to make the next step. Even poets and artists can count, even if poorly and think logically. And some physicists play the violin well and create paintings. Each of us is endowed with all abilities from birth but to varying degrees. That's how different kinds of intelligence appear, from mathematics to love. Yes, even that is a kind of intelligence. Some people have better emotional intelligence. These people understand their own and other people's emotions better than they can control them. Actually, this is a respected form of emotional intelligence. It helps people be more effective when interacting with others in difficult situations. There's also math intelligence, and people with this type tend to deal with abstractions rather than interpersonal relationships and emotions. But in any case, these are two different forms of intelligence. It is still unclear how they are related to each other, and we can't determine which is more rational. In general, it is difficult to understand not only the types of intelligence, but also how to assess it. It's not a physical object that can be measured in units of mass, density, speed. When we use silly criteria like IQ, we think for some reason that they measure one's intelligence, but they don't show one's intelligence. They show the ability to count, to sort through different operations, that's all. If Pushkin, Mozart, Kant, Schopenhauer, and others, it's a fairly large list of names, if they took this test, they would show extremely low points. Except for crazy people who, on the contrary, are very strong in combinatorics. They can quickly sum up or subtract. But it's different. What about all the geniuses that aren't normal? Because by definition, a genius can't be the norm. I wonder whether humanity as a whole is getting smarter or not. It seems that the answer is obvious. We know much more than 500 years ago. 
But let's not rush to conclusions. Today, any student can find everything on the internet. But is that intelligence? The fact is that there are internet networks, computers that create, as a matter of fact, the illusion of human awareness and availability of knowledge. But it is an illusion which allows us to satisfy our human needs, our ambitions, without giving neither knowledge nor real ideas about the world. In other words, people immerse themselves in a simulation environment and are sure that they have knowledge, skills, easily accessible information. Surprisingly, the world is becoming more complex and high-tech. But at the same time, we need less mental effort to live in it. At this point in evolution, we aren't moving forward. We are actively relapsing. The ideology of conformism and adaptions wins in our society. We strive to reproduce, have plenty of food, a lot of females, and transfer our genome to the next generation with the help of gilded Rolls-Royce. But only the most adaptive, yet intellectually poor, manage to do this. Therefore, despite the visible progress that is associated with the development of communications with numerous discoveries, the average brain size is still decreasing. Yes, it's true. On average, our brain is getting smaller. But the process didn't start in our time. It started tens of thousands of years ago. The reasons for this process are unknown to us, but it is obvious that the internet is not to blame, although it can make things worse. The famous three laws of robotics were formulated by the writer Isaac Asimov in the middle of the 20th century. In short, a robot cannot cause harm to a human. It is obliged to obey all his orders and thus take care of his safety. But in the famous science fiction writer's stories, there were cases when robots violated all three laws and threatened to kill their owners. What if some of our intelligent machines and systems turn their intelligence against us, and not in the pages of science fiction novels, but in real life? A robot with an intellect can act only if an outside goal is set by a human being. But a robot with consciousness must be able to set its own goals and develop plans for their achievement. That's the main difference. And the question arises whether we need such robots or not. Robots with intelligence pose no threat to us, but no one has set an aim to create a robot with consciousness. This is still a difficult question. Models of consciousness can be developed, but it is not necessary to create robots that have consciousness. We need to create robots that can solve complex tasks in conditions under which it is impossible or dangerous for a person to act. We need to create an artificial brain where the role of neurons will be performed by semiconductors, for instance, which are connected to other cells with certain connections, similar to natural brain connections. But again, do not forget that these are billions of cells and a much larger number of connections. I'm afraid to sound like an extremist, but it's possible today. And in theory, almost all problems related to the creation of such robots have been already solved. Nevertheless, an uprising of machines does not threaten us yet. So maybe we'd better not create artificial intelligence that possesses consciousness. Wouldn't it be better to focus all our efforts on understanding our own brain? After all, we truly know about just 1% of it.
Crazy, cool. A real brick. Were you in some kind of trance? It's simple physics. The force of the blow remains in the brick. It doesn't pass through it. Therefore, it has no traumatic effect. And the larger the brick, the less discomfort the person experiences. We often encounter what seems incomprehensible, strange, and therefore frightening. The reason tells us that everything in the world lives by its own laws, and everything has a natural explanation. We just don't always know where to look for it. The knowledge and understanding of what is happening are not always identical, and it is not always possible to make them equal. We know, but we very often don't understand. And this lack of understanding leads to an attempt to defame this knowledge somehow, to get rid of it, or to say that it is unrealistic, that it is impossible. But in fact, knowledge clearly tells us that the abilities of the human mind have no limits. In life, we constantly face the concept of the norm. We often hear the terms normal body, normal pulse, and blood pressure, normal cholesterol level. Norms are something that regulate our behavior when we communicate with other people. It's just normal. We are used to the fact that life around us is normal, or at least within the limits of our understanding of it. But is it normal to see what others don't see, to be able to do what no one else can? Unusual abilities always arouse interest, envy, or fear in society, and people who possess them really stand out in a crowd, to put it mildly. We often attribute abnormality to people who have something we don't understand. We usually have a subjective norm for this. Just look at this common expression. I just can't wrap my head around this idea. So if I can't understand it, therefore it must be abnormal. I have some friends who can neither see nor hear. How do they navigate in the world? By touch, that's all. And the most gifted of them entered Moscow University and they graduated from the psychology department. I met with one of them yesterday. He gave a presentation. He became a doctor and a PhD in psychology. He works as a professor and yesterday gave a lecture. He's blind. He can neither see nor hear. What do you think? Who is he? Is that normal? Of course it isn't. But in some respects, for instance, in his intelligence, he's better than most people. We have cards on which various emotions are written. I'll show them to you now. Fear. Perhaps you've heard of the phenomenon when objects and their signs are perceived by a person without the help of the senses. Now we'll try to demonstrate it. Anger and calm. Alexander, please mix up the cards and ask Natalia to determine where each emotion is. Natalia, our subject, has to guess which card I created with the inscription anger and unmistakably find it among the others without opening the envelope. So this card, this envelope. According to my emotions. Yes. There must be anger. You have those emotions. Yeah. Let's look inside. Anger is here too. Fear. They are very similar. And there's fear. Okay. They are somehow similar. Well, we've got anger. Natalia found the right card only on her second try. In my opinion, this does not mean much. There are only four envelopes. She is probably lucky. Let's try to give our subject another task. Under opaque plastic cups, we place the figures of a tiger, an elephant, and a zebra.
feels heavy. It must be the elephant. Let's check it. Okay, it's the elephant, right? Then this should definitely be the cat. What cat? The tiger. Feline. The tiger. Yes, the feline. Okay. And the zebra should be here. Zebra. So as for the tiger feature, there's actually something. Like an allergic reaction in my throat. I mean, everything that is connected with tigers and lions, it's definitely similar to these emotions. As for the elephant, there is kind of a heaviness in my head. The zebra means a little flickering. Well, now Vladimir will try to find among all the images hidden from his eyes with a thick sheet of cardboard, the image that I picked out. Orange. Great, well done. That's right, Vladimir, I'm impressed. Can you somehow explain how you did that? A certain sign comes to me in the form of excitement in the solar plexus area. This sign shows me that I'm holding the picture I'm looking for. Olga, Vladimir told us about his feelings, but is there any explanation closer to a scientific one with theories, hypotheses? I believe that the whole world has multiple dimensions. I mean, the world is not three-dimensional, but our consciousness is three-dimensional. The brain gives us a picture that is always three-dimensional. We have height, width, length. The information in the universe is recorded in the form of a hologram. Imagine we write orange and draw it in the form of a hologram, and imagine that the picture is made of glass. Okay, and if we drop it, it will break into many pieces. So if it's a hologram, on each piece we will have three oranges with the inscription orange. So we need only one piece of the picture? Yes. To recreate the whole picture? Yes, so our brain already has the information. There have been many stories of such demonstrations, and some people are satisfied with this explanation, but not scientists who rely solely on facts verified with the help of experiments. So far, even the phenomenon's very existence has not been scientifically confirmed. But it's a different matter when the barriers to knowledge were put in place not by the laws of nature, but by people. All restrictions are set by man. We tell ourselves it is impossible, and it doesn't happen, and we don't understand it further. When Albert Einstein was asked how he managed to become great and famous, he said the following phrase, the usual way. All of humanity knows that something is impossible. But then an ignorant man appears who doesn't know that it is impossible. He starts his research, and it turns out that it is possible. I don't think any of us today will call the genius Einstein crazy. Although, according to his contemporaries, the man who invented the theory of relativity was in many respects not like everyone else. His parents considered him inferior for a long time. But one thing can be said for sure, he wasn't normal. After all, a genius is someone who by definition does not fit into the framework of norms. Niels Bohr once said, what is lacking in physics? Not just new ideas, but crazy ideas. I mean, different ideas not the ideas that will continue what has already been found, introducing some element of novelty, so to speak, but those that could turn the whole view of the world upside down. That is what Einstein and Bohr did. But well, why can some of us do things others can't? The answer seems apparent. The key to success is innate abilities and a favorable environment for their development. Many people have those innate abilities but only a few show extraordinary results. Is it just because they were luckier than others? These methods have been used since the 1980s in medical practice, and they are very successful. 
Even now we use them. And I assure you that a man has enough strength, internal abilities, and opportunities which he does not even know anything about. We worked a lot with the athletes that participated in the Olympic Games of 1980, and almost everyone we worked with became prize winners. Most of them won gold. In 2008, I worked with a fencer who actually wasn't planning to compete in the Olympics. However, she became a gold medalist at the Beijing Olympics. She won a gold medal. Surely any professional athlete or, say, a circus performer will confirm that in order to achieve really good results, just training is not enough. Mental conditioning is no less important. It improves will, concentration, determination. And one needs something that cannot be put into words. Once I met a unique person. The person became the winner of the highest award in a juggling competition. I asked him how he managed to throw dozens of objects into space and catch them. He answered, you know, something snapped in my head and I slowed down time for myself. I clearly saw all the objects in the air. They fell slowly for me. And I managed to intercept them and throw them up again. It's not hard to improve your reaction time. You can see that for yourself. A simple experiment. The subject needs to catch the ruler and let the scale on it be a measure of the reaction time. 29, 24, 22. It seems quite easy. With each shot, the reaction time becomes faster. It's just regular training, no more. But is it possible to increase this number, not gradually, time after time, but instantly and by a lot? Yes, it is possible. Moreover, this ability is incorporated in each of us. It turns out that we can all anticipate a situation in a fraction of a second to model its development and calculate our options. Do not focus your eyes on the stick or the hands and feet of your enemy. Look through them. At some point, if you try to look at a person, you see him as a whole. In terms of the stance, it can be compared to the readiness to drive a car. You are looking straight ahead. That's where you need to focus. But out of the corner of your eyes, you can see the left, right, and back mirrors. At that moment, your focus should be absolutely everywhere. The driving process is very fast. Roads are full of construction sites, especially in a city. Therefore, it is necessary to react to a situation quickly without grabbing at anything, without isolating any details, any cars, hands, feet, etc. We can choose the desired pace when crossing a street, for example. We see approaching cars, measure the distance instantly, their speed, and understand how fast we must cross the street in order to avoid being run over. But it seems absolutely impossible to stop or even to slow down the course of time the way the juggler does. But it is possible. Once a man was sure that the sun revolves around the earth and the earth rests on elephants, turtles, whales. It was dangerous to imagine the world any other way. 
well, how could ancient scientists be mistaken? And what about the brilliant works of inventors and fiction writers who were ahead of their time? Their suggestions once seemed impossible. These authors were declared obsessed, abnormal, or dreamers at best. And today we admire their courage to be different. So what is the deciding factor of what is normal and what is not? A table might be perceived as a wooden object with delineated edges and a solid texture, and our brain already has a vision of what it is about, what it is for, and how we can use it. If the act of perception leads to the same or roughly the same result for most of the biological organisms living in the world, then probably there is a conditionally accepted norm. That is the most common variant of perception. These blots of paint are the famous images by Rorschach. They are one of the tests for the study of the psyche and its disorders. The task of the subject is to pick up the association created by the brain. It can be an image or an idea, a man, an animal, or a mythical creature, stationary or moving. So what do you see, say, in this picture? A bat? A monster's grin? Maybe a ritual mask of some tribe? And which of these associations will be the norm? The one that will get the most votes? If your option seems too eccentric to you, don't worry. The Rorschach test, like most others, doesn't indicate something is wrong with you. Although it will help you draw certain conclusions. But back to how we perceive the surrounding reality and where the line is between norm and deviation. A regular sheet of blue paper. Hardly anyone will argue with this, but obviously, this sheet is blue. Anyone who agrees with this will automatically fall into the category of normal, at least on this point. But we already know that the concept of normal is relative. Norms can change, but they will always exist. That's the point. It's impossible for everyone to have their own individual norms. It would be as though everyone were speaking their own language. We wouldn't understand each other in that case. I can invent my own language, but what is next? Who am I going to speak with? Myself? The same applies to norms. We can't do anything about it. What if I said this blue color sounds like the note E? Don't laugh. It turns out that there are people who, unlike most of us, hear colors and see sounds. This special abnormal perception is called synesthesia. Blue. It's a phenomenon that reflects the perception, not of a single elementary property, but connects several properties. For example, the French poet Arthur Rimbaud perceived letters painted in colors. He could say that the letter A is black, the letter E is white, another letter is blue. That is, his perception was formed like that. It is particular to creative people. It is, in fact, a reflection of their non-trivial view of life. Creativity, a thirst for search, and curiosity often give rise to the desire to do something extraordinary. Such people find it difficult to stay within the norm. Walking on coals is a famous phenomenon. Every time we hear about it, we imagine a yoga master, or at least a person specially trained for it. Well, in fact, how can an ordinary person walk on hot coals and remain completely unharmed? In France, scientists even carried out an experiment. 
They tested the thin sections of toughened tissue on volunteers' heels with the idea that maybe this tissue doesn't burn. Maybe that's why a person can walk on hot coals because their tissue doesn't burn. But they put that tissue on coals and it burned down. I've walked on burning coals more than 200 times. I do it from time to time and I do it consciously because this is a very unique, very interesting procedure. Two people are involved in our experiment. One has already repeatedly walked on hot coals, and the second is an absolute beginner without any preparation. We are quite sure that the first participant will be just fine. As for the second, we wish him the best of luck. Okay, don't rush. Lightly touch the coals with your feet. Yes, they burn a little. Careful, okay? According to an experienced instructor, you need to believe that walking on coals is possible in order to do it. But to overcome the fear of pain is not so easy, whatever you are told. So go. Faster. Truth be told, just believing isn't enough here. Once again, I'd like to say, don't try this without a specialist, because you can only do it in a trance state. Whether it is a trance or self-hypnosis or just a skillful application of the laws of physics, it doesn't really matter. The main and most surprising thing is that it works. What seems dangerous and impossible for many people is quite real for a few. Somehow, our brain in certain situations allows or helps our body to do the most incredible things. It turns out that everyone can walk on coals. It is absolutely not necessary to have any special abilities or train for a long time in order to do this. Each of us has what is necessary for it. But will it be just as easy for us to walk on air or on water? Alas, our brain only controls the world within us. The world outside and the laws of nature are beyond its control. Natural disasters, catastrophes, animal attacks, in extreme situations, in an effective state, a person sometimes does what he or she is incapable of doing under normal conditions. Why does that happen? Each of us has something that resembles a speed limit. You can drive faster, but it's dangerous and unsafe. But sometimes, at a critical moment, what limits a person turns off, and they do the impossible, because it will help them survive. In an extreme situation, the world no longer exists around us. We act unconsciously. What does that mean? It means that consciousness always acts as a kind of sensor, as a corrector. When the world around someone stops and he or she uses their unconscious, natural, genetically inherited abilities, he or she has the opportunity to do a lot. It is in this type of situation that the control of consciousness is turned off. There have been many stories of people who suddenly had enormous strength, speed, and endurance. As a rule, this happens only in incredibly extreme and stressful situations and for a very short time. When the danger is passed, consciousness reactivates its control. And that's okay. But sometimes consciousness plays evil jokes on us, which in some cases even lead to pathology. Good evening, Alexander. Why do you think some people 
are called abnormal? Well, I don't know. Maybe some people count lampposts on the road, talking to themselves like you're doing right now. After all, sometimes it happens that there are several personalities living in one person, like a Russian doll. The American criminal Billy Milligan was tried for serious crimes he didn't commit. More precisely, the person who appeared before the court hadn't committed them. It had been done by his other selves. Psychiatrists counted about 24 other selves. As a result of mental and physical upheavals in childhood, a protective mechanism had emerged. There were other personalities, and Milligan could hide behind them, figuratively speaking. What does the psychological analysis of such people show? It shows that certain psychological problems form before the person was born. When the mother was worried or anxious, when the mother had to endure fear or horror, it became part of her child. Then the child, filled with these fears and horrors, is born into this world. And then people in this world notice that he is somewhat different. Either he is thoughtful, or he is just silent, or he is closed off. And then comes the second self, or a mental state that controls the person's actions and deeds. And over time, it can aggravate. After all, the person experiences stress, shock, agitation, and unrest more and more often, and it increases. And more than one personality can develop in this person over time. Surprisingly, each of them can have their own skills and abilities. They can play musical instruments, know martial arts techniques, speak several foreign languages, but the person has never been trained in these skills. There are a lot of hypotheses why this happens. However, science remains categorical on the matter. I think it happens because we have certain associations in our subconscious, spontaneously. When we make an unexpected decision to do something, I think it is still the work of our subconscious with the information that is already there. Someone can be good at learning foreign languages and that person starts speaking another language fluently shortly after he started learning it. But that doesn't mean that he was born with it. Most likely, his subconscious or his neural structure was already predisposed to it. And a small amount of information that's been added is easily absorbed. And indeed, the person learns the language faster and can speak it better. But I don't think that anyone, including myself, can start speaking Hindi for no reason at all, because I haven't studied it and there's no way that I can just start speaking it. But a pathologically ill psyche is not required in order to have extraordinary abilities. How difficult. Sounds like a tongue twister. These letters and syllables seem impossible to pronounce. I doubt I could ever learn this language. But there are people who can learn and easily speak more than two or three foreign languages. They can speak five, ten, or even more, and without needing to. To them, it doesn't matter what language they learn, Finnish, Arabic, or Japanese, they are all easy. Some people only need a month or even a week to master a new language, and some even claim that they simply know a certain language but cannot explain where it came from. First of all, it is genetic memory. We all have a mother and a father. They also have parents, and their grandparents also have parents. 
That is, the practical amount of information that is transmitted to a person grows exponentially. After all, your ancestors lived 2,000 years ago. Where did they live? You don't know. You can't trace it. So it's likely that some of your ancestors lived in Arab countries, for example. Some of your ancestors live somewhere else. Indeed, such hypotheses were put forward in the 19th century, but now they are irrelevant. Knowledge of language is not transmitted genetically. People are created that way. We always look for explanations of what is happening. Our consciousness does not allow blank spots, and therefore it fills in the gaps, so to speak, with what is at hand. There is a violation of perception which is related to greater distortions. There are illusions when we see an object, but perceive it differently. Children often see different creatures, ghosts, and ordinary objects. Yeah, that's an illusion. It might occur under conditions which we consider normal, as well as with severe pathological disorders. So in and of themselves, illusions are not a sign of developing mental illness. After all, all of us in childhood read tales about a terrible witch or an evil stepmother. And too vivid an imagination can, under contingent circumstances, revive them. Another thing is hallucinations. Unlike with illusions, when we see a real object differently than it really is, with hallucinations there is no need for an object at all. This is only the result of our brain activity, and in most cases, it is pathological. When there are no sounds in reality, but a person hears them, it is due to the fact that active brain markers such as dopamine and serotonin cause excitement in these areas, an increase in the number of these mediators, and as a result, an increase of the receptor activity of the area, which points out disease. So if the thyroid gland function is disturbed, certain hormones increase and we get certain effects. Tachycardia, pallor sweating, weight gain or decrease, dilation or narrowing of the pupils. The same thing happens in this case. Receptors of the central nervous system get stimulated in a particular area. From a scientific look at the brain and the psyche, hallucinations are not the norm. And in this sense, the famous mathematician John Nash wasn't a normal person. He suffered from schizophrenia for almost his entire life. But this did not prevent him from becoming a Nobel Prize winner and gaining worldwide recognition. The subconscious is like a repository of all the information that a person possesses, including genetic, of course. This is how we determined what consciousness is. That is, consciousness is here and now in this real world. And the subconscious is, first of all, our memory, including our genetic memory. Strange as it may seem, our subconscious is not only the past and the present, it is also the future, according to some of our greatest and most famous scientists. By the way, there are no absolutely normal people. Psychiatrists like to joke that there are only under-examined people. In all seriousness, our inner world is largely determined by the subconscious. Is it possible to penetrate into its depths and thus to control our abilities and even our destiny? I'm just watching the changing numbers and pictures on the screen. You might ask, how is it possible to understand what's in my head? It turns out that the brain's reactions to these pictures 
can reveal a lot about what is hidden in my subconscious. That is, the visual analyzer makes a record, and the brain's response is recorded. But the person doesn't have time to realize what it is they're seeing right in front of them in such a short period of time. Why? It takes 10 to 14 milliseconds for stimulus information to be presented. This exposure can be compared to, say, a situation when a person is driving down the road through a forest. If he's driving at high speed, he knows he's got a forest on both sides. But he won't be able to see a single tree separately. Hypnosis, neuro-linguistic programming, psychotronic weapons. Science has to establish which methods really exist and work and which methods are just a myth. However, it doesn't matter if extraordinary abilities and skills fit into the norm or not. They are so rare because we can solve most of the tasks in everyday life without their help. Buddha and a yogi met at a river crossing. The yogi asked Buddha, Why are you waiting for the ferry? You are Buddha. You can walk on water. And Buddha said, What for? I'll wait for the ferry. The yogi said to him, Well, look at how I can walk on water and he crossed the river, and Buddha took the ferry. On the other side they met. The yogi who looked pleased with himself asked Buddha, Did you see me walking on water? Buddha said, Yes, of course. How much time did it take you to learn how to walk on water? My whole life, the man said. You see my point, it took me just a half rupee to get across the river. Society has always avoided and oppressed those who, by their behavior or abilities, differed from the majority. Some deserved it, others did not. So how abnormal are these people? Let professionals answer this question. Being different doesn't mean being dangerous or crazy. Perhaps it is a gift that will benefit all mankind. <laughs>